Bramborough back with some Grand Tactician Civil War. And we are in the middle of a CSA campaign, the Confederacy, in version 1.06. It's winter 1861. We're in December, so early winter. Uh, but there's quite a bit going on. Uh, we've had some fighting recently in Missouri and Virginia. Uh, We've moved to take uh, the city of Cairo in southern Illinois, and so uh, and we got a siege going down down here in Florida. So there's stuff going on. But before we get into the campaign, as I uh, have recently started to do, we address a couple of uh, viewer comments. Uh, one comment was, "Hey, your raiding fleet, by which I think is meant this." Uh, Atlantic blockade fleet up here uh, off the coast of Long Island. How's it doing for supply and provisions? And the answer to that is, uh, is it doing fine on ammo? They haven't done any fighting. They haven't been attacked. Kind of, you know, kind of waiting to see if this Long Island Sound Squadron does so. They're in raiding mode. <laughs> they haven't done so yet. Um, but we're about 50% on provisions and coal. Uh, but I think that's pretty typical. I, 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 in my experience with this game, you don't really have to worry that much about that sort of thing. With fleets, it's kind of abstracted. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on this and see if we can uh, get a little bit better idea of how exactly uh, that gets automated. Like, I don't know, is it just kind of uh, reflecting maybe supply ships going back and forth periodically to top off or bring a little bit extra? Or does it uh, peel off a couple ships at a time to go back and resupply? Which I think is, is what the field book or the manual says. Um, but we'll keep an eye on it. But I don't think we're going to have to move these guys because they run out of fuel and food. I've never had to in the past at any rate okay uh, there was one comment that talked a little bit about uh, the three inch ordnance and the 10 pound parrot rifle which are some of the projects that we hope to take in the near future matter of fact let's look at that are we up to uh... getting real close Right? So these two projects are about the same, well they're the same price, and one gives you the 3 inch ordnance rifle, and one gives you the 10 pound parrot. And I've talked before about, eh, I don't really know which one I'm going to do. And there was a comment about that, uh, which led me to go back and look at the stats of these things, and it turns out that there's a little bit of uh, discrepancies. Because I don't have these unlocked, <laughs> I can't actually look at the tooltips on the specific guns. Uh, I think I can on the 10 pound parrot because we've captured a few of those. Do I have a captured? Yeah, I don't. I've got a, some captured uh, three, 10 pound parrots, but I don't have a 3 inch ordnance. Not yet, anyway. So what, So when we look at the uh, stats here on the 10 pounder parrot, what we see is very good accuracy, 1850 yards range, and 2.5 rounds per minute. This matches what is shown for the 10 pound parrot in the manual, the game manual. So the tooltip and the manual match for this gun. For the three inch ordnance rifle, which I cannot show in game at the moment, uh, the numbers are actually extremely, the, the, the tooltip stats uh, are very, very similar to the point where they're almost practically the same gun. Um, Worms and Warriors helped me out by taking a look at the tooltips that he's got available in his Union campaign, since I didn't have access to a save where I had a 3-inch ordinance I could look at. 
The three inch ordinance in game tooltip says 1830 yards, excellent accuracy, and 2.5 rounds per minute. So the guns are extremely similar with just on the accuracy, maybe a very tiny nod toward the three pound ordinance. But you, you know, but you really can't go wrong with either one. They basically do the same thing. However, the manual stats for the three inch ordinance are significantly different. The manual re reflects 1,523 yards, very good accuracy, matching the parrot, and a 3.0 rounds per minute. So that begs the question, which is to be believed, the manual or the in-game tooltip? And this isn't, this isn't, there are other discrepancies in weapons between manual and tooltips. Um, I have always proceeded and am continuing to proceed under the assumption that if there's a discrepancy in stats between tooltips and manual, go with the in-game tooltip. I think that's a pretty reasonable assumption. Uh, and until I have evidence that that is not correct, that's what I'm going to continue to do. Uh, I did put a post in the Steam discussion about uh, in Steam discussions about this and you know, kind of bringing this to the devs attention because that manual was supposed to be updated it has been updated for 1.06 um, anyway well, what's kind of interesting about this if we assume that it's the tooltips to go with then this project really isn't it's not really a choice between the three inch ordnance and the 10 pound parrot. They're so similar that it's kind of the same, right? So it's really a choice between do you want six pound wires with rifled artillery or do you want the heavier 20 and 30 pound parrots with the parrot rifle project? And that's the real difference between these two. Um, I think if I were, and I, and I think if I were going to do a, a union campaign, I would probably go toward the parrots, uh, for the simple reason that there just generally tends to be more fort sieging going on in a union campaign than there is in a CSA one. And I think that those heavier parrots uh, would be useful in that regard. Now we have done some fort sieging and are doing some fort sieging. We've taken Fort Norfolk, he, uh, not Fort Norfolk, Fort Monroe here, and are currently sieging Fort Pickens down here in Florida. All right, but this is done. This is in progress, right? So this, you know, that's over with. By the time we get. <laughs> any rifled artillery and I just don't know that there's that there's going to be any more fort sieging going on you know the Union doesn't have any forts way out here in the Trans Mississippi or the um kind of the, the western theater well, there's a few out here we might siege this fort but that's not a huge thing I guess at one point we may get around to sieging Fort Washington and Fort McHenry, maybe. But it's not a, it, that's not a huge concern. Um, with the Union, there tends to be a lot more fort sieging, particularly in this area. Um, at least the way that I play. Uh, you know, Fort Norfolk goes down at some point. Uh, this fort here, which I think is Fort Macon, goes down here at Moorhead City. There's some forts at Wilmington. And the extent to which you go down and try to take ports on the Atlantic coast, or on the Gulf Coast for that matter, there's just a lot more forts that uh, you, get, you get the point. So I'm not sure. I think, uh, I think I may opt for the rifled artillery still 
just because I think I'll probably buy more and use more six pound wires in the field armies. Because uh, those heavier uh, parrots, they are, of course, longer ranged and higher damage, but they have a pretty low uh, rate of fire uh, and they're pretty expensive. And economy is a factor. Okay. And then finally, we had a whole bunch of comments <laughs> about the battle in the last episode. Uh, and legitimate comments, very much so. You know, it's not very common that the player loses a battle in Grand Tactician, and that happened in the last episode. So there were lots of comments about it, and the fact that it's, you know, it's not a common occurrence, I think it's worth talking about some. And rather than just, uh, blathering on about it here in the uh, while looking at the campaign map um, I've recorded separately a little kind of a post battle analysis or just addressing those comments uh, while looking at the uh, the battle map from that battle anyone who uh, you know anyone who served in the military or in, in probably many other walks of life as well uh, is probably pretty familiar with uh, the process where you do an operation, you do an exercise, uh, and to include combat operations, and then afterward there is a kind of a, you know everyone gets together and it's like okay lessons learned what went well what didn't go so well what can we do better and that sort of thing. And there's all kinds of different names for those AARs, hot washups. Uh, Etc. So anyway, let's go and do a little bit of an AAR on the Third Battle of Lebanon. Okay, so I'm in YouTube right now looking, you know, this is just a, just to have a visual reference here. Um, several things that I could have done better in this battle. Uh, let's see, there was the, a pretty big one was uh, artillery, okay, and so th this is right around the, the opening, yeah, we're still in deployment phase, so this is how I deployed the troops at the morning of the second day, and uh, here's the two CAV, not CAV, artillery battalions here, these are both 24 pound howitzer uh, battalions. And I've left this open spot here uh, in front of them to give them a clear field of fire. And, uh, you know, it may be restricted, well, it probably is restricted a little bit by these skirmishers out here. But uh, the basic idea is that giving them a clear field of fire and then there's infantry on both sides to include skirmishers to deliver flanking fire against... Uh, federal units coming up the middle toward the artillery and they're set a little bit back from the line from the infantry line in the fortifications anyone who's been watching my campaigns you know is pretty familiar with the fact I think that I've done this a lot in the past I don't do it every single time it kind of depends but uh, you know this is not a new thing for me and in the past uh, it has usually worked it has usually worked this time it did not and we all saw uh, in the last episode how at one point a a cavalry brigade lined up right here in the middle and there were units here I mean Ross by that point I think had broken but Waitman had come up he's on he's on the left flank uh, Pierce was here although I think he was pointed toward initially he was pointed toward uh, infantry over here on the on the right uh, and that cash brigade didn't give a damn about that he just bored right in there and and then the second line of you know, the other thing that uh, I was hoping would happen that didn't was it was like, okay, time to, time to lose some canister into that guy. 
and uh, yeah, it's hard, you know, it's hard to tell. Either they didn't get the canister shot off, or they did, and it wasn't enough to break that incoming calf. And he he tore him up, sure did. And that's the first time that's ever happened to me. So lesson learned, and gotta be said, good job to the AI on that too. It's not the first time that cavalry in a similar position has ever been attacked. Um, I've had that happen before, but in the case of infantry, they're moving in slower and they definitely take too much damage. They do get the canister fire um, and they are beaten back. Okay, so this worked in that regard. And I do think I've had I don't remember if it was this campaign or late in the last CSA campaign, but we had another case where I had artillery deployed like this and uh, some cavalry was coming in on them, but the artillery got that canister shot off in time and, and routed them very close at close range, but did route them uh, and were able to maintain the position and keep fighting. So this is the first time that I've had uh, an enemy unit successfully come in and charge in on the cav, uh, on the artillery, uh, in this kind of situation. Uh, so it's a long-standing practice, uh, practice that has worked in the past, and this time it did not. <laughs> Kudos to the AI for doing that. Okay, so that that was uh, obviously a major factor. And is it a mistake? I don't know. Uh, is it a risky deployment that can backfire on you? Clearly, yes. <laughs> so I don't know. You know, I'll probably. I'll definitely keep this in mind in future artillery deployments. But I'll but I want them in this position because you know I do want them up here in canister range, um, which isn't very far, and uh, it just didn't work out this time. Uh, another issue that was brought up, uh, l legitimately so, in in several comments was not shown on this uh, screen here, but my cab is way over on the other side of the map because after they had gone over to scout out the federal approach, I forgot to move them back. And this is actually, it's the morning of day two, the fighting's about to start, but we're still in the deployment phase. Right now, I should have simply redeployed those CAV over here on one of the flanks or in the rear as a reserve or what have you. Uh, and that that would have been incredibly helpful um, and could have made the difference. Uh, Marmaduke could have come over here and helped out with uh, the infantry attack that developed on this side. And, and the battle was very close. And that alone could have made the difference between uh, a win and a loss. So was that a mistake? Absolutely. And I recognized it at the time. I said, you know, it wasn't like a decision. It was just, I just flat forgot they were over there. That's, that's all there was to that. Um, let's see. There was a comment that... Uh, some made a comment along the lines of uh, the, the objective system and sometimes you just get in defensible positions. I don't know about that. Uh, I, I kind of like the objective system in this game. Uh, and I think I've mentioned that before. Where, um, you know, there's only so many maps. And they're, they're incredibly detailed, all right? A lot of work goes into making these. They're not procedurally generated. Um, they... You know, I understand why there's not that many maps in the game, and they're big. And the the fact that there's different objectives uh, for each battle means that 
different parts of the map get used and there's different tactical situations in different parts of the map and different terrain and uh you know like this is the third battle in a row uh in at least in this area where we've been on this wilson creek map and then every battle has been a little bit different in this case a lot different but i don't think this was a it it was a little bit more problematic than the previous two battles for sure but I don't think this was an indefensible position by any stretch. Um, you know, the, the objective is back up here on high ground. Uh, if the, you know, if, if the AI had come from this direction over here, we're facing kind of uh, east here, I think, or southeast. If the AI had come from the north, um, you know, there was a creek he had to cross here. So, you know, and that's the way that you can see the uh, fortifications down here from day one. That's the way we were initially facing. I thought that was a pretty good position. I think, I thought this was a decent position. It's not as good. Um, it is still high ground here, but you, you've got this ridge line that can, kind of runs through here. So it's it's really kind of flat or at very least not as commanding as in the other direction and that was a good move from the AI as well coming this way rather than directly from the north and it was a reasonable route to take I think as well in retrospect And I talked about this in the vi in the video at the, at the time I did consider you know there's a crossing it's kind of hidden by little's info panel but but there's a crossing here on this creek and then you've got these crossings over here so in retrospect maybe defending a little bit further forward here and here would have been the better idea after all i chose not to do that because our army was about half the size of the federal army and that would have spread us out a little bit too much but, but i think that probably would have worked i could have put a division here i could have put a division here kind of put a reserve division in the middle kind of on the edge of these woods to go in either direction get some artillery in here and then the marmaduke's uh, scouting could have allowed us to kind of shift to one side or the other uh, as it became clearer which way they were going to come with the same objective point here so i i don't think the you know maybe i could have set up a better position but the fact that the objective was where it was i don't i don't think was really a huge uh factor it, one thing i didn't really take fully into account was <clears throat> i gave the you know this is all open ground they don't have any woods to go through they don't have any creeks to cross they don't have any well there's a little bit of fence they had to deal with that's not much though um and i think what we saw in that battle was that the ai does better with open ground um which then leads to an opinion i've i've, I've had for a while i don't know how much i've talked about in video comments but the basic AI decision making doesn't really strike me as the the whole issue with the AI in this game. Given fairly good ground to maneuver on, you know, AI Morel did a pretty good job in this battle. At least gave us a very nice fight. Um, so I think a big problem with uh, that, that I hope that you know a big problem with the AI that I hope they take a look at is 
most of the time when you're just looking at the battle it's like oh my gosh what are they doing it's not necessarily that what they're trying to do is bad it's that man they get all hung up in woods and creeks and walls and fences and buildings and they just get so disorganized from it which happens to player units as well it's just over time and playing the game the, you know the player kind of adapts to that and kind of knows what to do and what not to do <laughs> to you know keep things organized and and and, and the, i think that's an area where the where the ai has lots of problems in this game it's almost like you know they've created a level of detail and complexity with the terrain and uh all the various uh stats they've they've created a a game and maps and rule sets that are incredibly complex for the AI to deal with. And uh, in the absence of some of that in a simpler situation, AI did pretty well here. Um, one thing I thought they, that they did really well was strong attacks on both sides, right? It was a general attack across the uh, whole line which made it extremely problematic for any attempt to uh, use a, a, an unengaged flank to reinforce the heavily engaged flank, which is a pretty typical pattern in these things. Um, and in this case, I wasn't able to do that. I think there was one attempt where I, you know, belatedly tried to get uh, one brigade from the left side over to the right, but it just was too little too late. And let's see. And then there was a comment about, um, well, you know, you have too many muskets in this army. 100% agreed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this entire division over here was still musket armed and still is musket armed. And that's, you know, I mean, you guys have been seeing in the campaign. I've got Mississippis on order. I've got Plains Rifles on order. I've got Reboards on order. Not great, but better than muskets, right? They just haven't arrived yet. We, yeah, I've still got too many muskets in all the armies. All of them. <laughs> no, no argument. And in fact, if we'd had uh, rifle arm brigades over here on the right, I think this battle would, would have turned out okay. Okay. Now for that, let's head back out to the campaign map in this episode. Okay, we are back on the campaign map. And let's turn this front line thing off here. What do we got going on, theater by theater? Okay, well over here in Missouri, as we just talked about at length, lost a battle over here, that battle is still going on. Um, so as soon as that stops, then uh, Price is going to be retreating. <laughs> may not retreat very far, may only go as far as Springfield, but uh, He's, going, he's probably going to have to keep retreating um, if they come in on him again. And uh, we'll just have to see how that pans out. May wind up going all the way back down to Fort Smith. So the Union is kind of, you know, they've won this round in, uh, in Missouri. So we may have to, maybe we'll be able to kind of hang on here if they let up. Or we may have to come back down into Arkansas. We'll just see how it goes. Johnson's army has taken Cairo, and I didn't talk about it in the kind of the the hot wash there. But um, there was uh, another comment about you know you've just got the one army, you got multiple Union armies, and uh, you know as soon as you saw those pop up, you know maybe we should have moved another army over into Missouri, and I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, it does beg the question, where was that army going to come from? <laughs> uh, I'm already, you know, kind of nervous that Johnston is already this far west at Cairo. Uh, Kentucky is wide open. These Union armies here, Army of the West, has moved over here. Uh, there is a new Army of the Ohio that's 18,000 strong and apparently moving. Okay. 
there's the Army of the Cumberland, which is still small for now, but you know, I, I don't see that Johnson committing into the Trans Mississippi is such a hot idea. I think it's more likely he's going to have to react and head back upriver uh, to deal with a federal movement on Louisville or coming down here south of Covington this way. Yeah, you get the idea. Um, we've got uh, Bragg does have a lot of newly recruited troops that we're currently down here besieging Fort Pickens with and that's mainly because I'm not quite ready for them to be used elsewhere and they're getting their first combat uh, modifier out of the way but uh, Bragg's units which I can't open up right now I, well, I yeah I can do it in this mode I think Okay, so there, there's some infantry here. There's actually a lot of artillery here, and there's some cav. Uh, but they are all still mixed musket armed. And I don't have rifles to give them. Uh, the artillery, you know, they all... Well, okay, I've got one 24-pound howitzer. Okay, so we have... I did put some 24-pound howitzers in here. So the artillery is kind of okay as far as what we have. These are still smoothbore short-range artillery. Uh, but I've been kind of hoping to keep these units out of the operational armies until I've got better weapons for them. Both the infantry and the cav. So we don't have a whole lot. I mean, I could, I could probably give some of these guys Springfield muskets. That's about all I got. If we look at our rifles here, you know, we don't have enough of these. We don't have enough of these. Um, Springfield rifle muskets. I've got uh, 1,200 of these. Not enough for a brigade here. Only 600 Mississippis. Only 500 Plains rifles. And we've got orders. we got 50,000 uh, Mississippis coming. We've got uh, 25,000 Plains rifles coming. Got uh, 25,000 reboard must. These are actually coming pretty quick. Only seven days left on these reboards. Which aren't great themselves, but they're better than mixed and Springfield muskets for sure. Uh, it looks like maybe I've got enough Springfield musketoons for a cav brigade. I could probably put those out somewhere. And that's about all we got. I can give those brigades Springfield muskets, which would be a tiny uh, improvement, but they're still smooth bores. So yeah, once we can get uh, some rifles into the hands of this infantry, um, even if it's just reboards, uh, yeah, definitely. We can either form another force or, more likely, I may send some of those brigades to Price's army. It's, it, no question, Price needs some help. Uh, even more now. He's down to about 10,000 men. So I think a couple of those brigades are going to come out west. Uh, perhaps one of those calf brigades. And then one other thing we can do, I mentioned in a uh, previous episode that there are some artillery battalions in these forts over here. I think there's three or four independent artillery battalions along these uh, forts that not only are available, but also have 12-pound Napoleons, which given our current availability of artillery is a pretty good gun. So uh, some of that artillery may be coming over here to uh, Price as well. But Price isn't the only army that needs these weapons. Uh, Johnston. I don't think there's uh, hardly any rifles in this force. Here in Virginia, you know, we've got uh, several Union armies bopping around in here as well. Uh, and those three armies together have significantly more troops than our three armies together. 
by uh, twenty or thirty thousand men, I think. You know, the army of the occupation alone has got over thirty thousand men. None of our three armies here are remotely close to that. So, none of these guys are going west. And Johnson's already kind of sketchy with all of Kentucky to worry about uh, and keeping Tennessee defended, which is kind of the whole idea of uh, fighting in Kentucky. I don't think he can come over here. Anyway, so there's the outlook there. Um, and just recruiting a bunch more troops, A, they wouldn't be well armed yet, and B, that costs money. <laughs> And uh, our credit rating isn't in a free fall, but it is an issue and don't want to get into a worse situation. And so, you know, there's, we're kind of working on a situation where we can get things like tariff act, uh, impressment, come down here, maybe the second government funding, do some war bonds and just make sure that we can afford what we recruit in addition to buying the weapons for them. And in fact, we actually don't have that enormous a volunteer pool from which to recruit anyway. Right. And as far as our little engineers, uh, first engineers, Clark has arrived up here at this station and he is building a... Uh, Telegraph station here. We'll be ready in 10 days. And the second engineers have completed their telegraph at uh, Knoxville and are under orders to head up to Jonesboro. We'll put another one here and build this line up through the Appalachian Valley so that we have a straighter telegraph connection uh, coming from Richmond. I had talked before about a, you know, once we got Cairo captured, to plop a fort here. That it would be worth the cost to ensure that we lock down control of the Mississippi above the uh, confluence here where the Mississippi and the Ohio come together. And that would help defend Cairo and would block the river. So I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I think we probably have a pretty good spot here. I think that'll do it right there. Boom. Uh, 14 million, and I probably just ensured that I'm going to issue uh, bonds again at the end of the month. <laughs> I think it's a worthwhile investment, though. Okay, we talked about those armies, and basically, uh, you know, we're kind of maintaining winter quarters up here in um, Virginia. Actually, I want to get these uh, armies back into defensive stance. And they're just keeping Northern Virginia, especially Alexandria. free from union control. On the Navy side, uh, I think of, you know, nothing particularly new there other than uh, what we talked about already with this uh, blockade fleet. <coughs> Our frigates are getting pretty close to completion. I think they're in the 80 percent 85 percent range so it won't be long before we're able to put a fleet together here to br to lift the blockade on uh, Gosport and with that at long last it's good time rolling <laughs> Somebody made a joke that, I bet it takes you 20 minutes to tie your shoes. Yeah, no argument. <laughs> I aspire to 20 minutes.
<laughs> it's currently taking me 25 minutes. Okay, so they're in defensive mode. They just, looks like they just really don't want us coming for Cincinnati. That's fine. You can sit there. How long is this fort going to take? 30 days. That's actually not bad. That's pretty fast, actually. And Johnson's army will get a little bit of perk slot XP from doing that as well. So that, I think it's a fine thing for him to do right now. Okay. Okay, so he's free now. Okay, Army of Indiana is content to just sit and build uh, a supply depot. Let's just move... Uh, Oh, I can't even move Price until he gets back to Yellow Readiness unless I give him an order to go all the way to Arkansas. I can't give him a destination inside Missouri because it's a Union State at this readiness level. That sucks. Okay. I don't know if I'm quite ready for him to move back into Arkansas now. If they kind of slow down their attacks, I'd much rather hang on to at least this supply depot, so let's see if we can do that. Unfortunately, he's just like an inch out of range to actually draw from that uh, depot, and he's way low on both small arms and artillery ammo. Looking over here. Okay, they're in defensive mode over here. Fair enough. Uh, somebody was wounded and came back. Who was that? B. Don't really remember B being wounded, but he's back. <laughs> Speaking of wounded, uh, let's see. I think uh, Little. Division commander was wounded in that last battle. Let's just double check. I don't know if I changed him out or not. Oh, yeah, the game changed him out. So the game promoted Pierce, one of his brigade commanders, to command of that division. I think I'm okay with that. Pierce isn't bad. However, it plugged Hardy into command of Pierce's old brigade. Which obviously he'd be a very good commander for it. Right? However, I think I want to use Hardy elsewhere. It's almost like he's too good for that. And if I leave him here, I'll forget he's there. <laughs> so, let's... Well, how about... Eh... Van Dorn's a possibility. These are Brigadiers. What have we got for Colonels? Let's go with Cabell. I think that I think that's fine. The other problem I have is these are the two artillery battalions that got wrecked in that battle. Okay, Alexander still has seven guns, so he's still kind of viable there. Um, and those those numbers will come back up. And I don't want to mess... It, it, they do have two stars of experience. What about Derek?
Okay, we got f seven guns in Alexander's battalion. We've got five guns. I think I'm just gonna combine the two. And that's still just a 12 gun battalion, medium sized. Not even close to full. And right now they are both below default sm small size battalions. And, I've, and I'm planning to move... You know what? Let's go ahead and do that now. Um, let's combine these two. I mean, it'll take forever. I, they will eventually grow in size again, but it's going to take a long time. Uh, I'm going to combine these two. Okay, so that's pretty deep. He dropped his stars a little bit, but not all the way to zero. Okay. And... I actually want Fort Garrisons this time. Yeah. There's a 12-pound Napoleon Battalion at Fort Pulaski. Come on over to Missouri. It's going to take a while for them to get there. Well, 22 days. That's not terrible. Fort Macon. That's outside Moorhead City. Let's move those to Missouri. And there's still a garrison there, and they've got their fort guns. It's a small garrison. And Fort Johnson. Okay. So now, uh... Now we're in a better spot here for artillery. And I think it's probably about it. Those three battalions, yeah, you know, Fort Nor nothing at Fort Norfolk, Fort Caswell. Those are also Napoleons. I think those will go somewhere else. Um, we got three battalions on the way to Missouri. I think that's good for now. Who else needs some? Uh, <laughs> Artillery. Uh, Johnson looks okay. Joe Johnston. Beauregard looks okay. Let's give some more artillery to Magruder. Wait a minute, where is Fort Caswell? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a coastal fort, that's fine. Let's send these Napoleons to Magruder. That'll be fine. Anybody else? Nope, not these guys. Yeah, so then we get into the stretch of forts that have some little infantry brigades. This is going to eventually... We're still growing these. They're tiny. Not ready to put them in the field yet. Okay. Let's keep time moving. Okay, there we go. We've got our next Militia Act. That should help this uh, volunteer manpower pool a little bit. Okay.
Okay, that's good. And so now I've got this, and as discussed before, I'm going to bounce back and let's go with the Terrafact. The main downside of this is that our relations with Europe degrade. I don't care. <laughs> I want them. I want that sweet, sweet tariff revenue. Okay, we come up, okay, we're in yellow readiness now. Let's just pull back at least so that price can draw supply. And the, it's like they're listening to me. I mean, that's not the first time in this campaign that I say I'm gonna do an act or I've just completed an act and the union matches it. <laughs> so they've gone tariff as well. Okay, let's get Price back here to Springfield just to ensure that he can uh, draw from this depot. He needs ammo. We've got a fair amount of ammo in that depot. Price needs it. Even with the, even with the winter attrition moving. Let's do that. That's good. Telegraph is almost done here. When this telegraph station's done, I'm going to bring uh, Clark. That's Clark commanding there. I'm going to bring him over here and get this telegraph link up to Fort Smith. Which actually, it almost reaches. We just need to put it on the east side of Fort Smith, kind of over here. Okay, Union's uh, doing the Medal of Honor. Bully for them. Okay, these engineers have gotten to Jonesboro. We can find a spot to put the. There we go. It's about half price for that telegraph station. I say that sometimes, I don't know what exactly causes that. I'm glad when it happens. <laughs> I'll be interested, when, these, when this telegraph line is, I'll, I'll be interested to see if the game shifts the main trunk down through here. Instead of going down through these states. There we go. Yeah, we just... Issued more bonds. Okay. As expected. With the fort construction. How's that fort doing? I feel like this, the speed of fort construction is a little bit higher than it was in 1.05. Kind of feels that way. Is this another... Have we issued two bonds? No. It just That was just the same message. Yeah. Arrived, arrived. Okay. Are you drawing supply now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, he, he's already in much better shape for Artie ammo. Which means he's probably just completely emptied this depot. There's still a little bit there. That's good. His readiness has dropped back down to orange because of the movement. Actually, I think that readiness may be because I am sending those artillery battalions to him. So now you know, he doesn't have all of his forces on station. I think that's the main reason why he dropped back down to orange. Oop, Billy Yank's moving up here. What you up to? You just crossed the river to Covington.
I think it's a good little showcase here of the value of using these little gunboat fleets on the rivers. Uh, if these weren't here, I don't think we'd have any idea of what's going on with these two armies. What is this army doing? Okay. Staying static, building a supply depot. Army of Ohio is on the move. That is 18,000 troops, and it sure smells like they're interested and headed to Lexington. And therefore, probably Louisville right after that. Sixteen days left on this fort. I kind of can't. I kind of can't move Johnston right now because I built that fort. Well, maybe they'll take Louisville, and then maybe we'll go take it back. But I think that shows exactly what I was talking about earlier on, yeah, I don't think I want to move Sidney Johnson into Missouri. He's already got too much real estate he's supposed to be covering himself. And if I, I don't have imminent plans, but when I do get another kind of uh, core or small army ready, I think it's going to be over in this theater. That also probably won't be in Missouri. Okay, we've got our uh, projects. Let's take a look at some projects here. There's a ton of them. All right, first things first, nothing on politics. So my, my intent for economic subsidies has been to get levels in market reform. The problem with that is I haven't built that many. I've built a few, but not that many markets. So there's not too much for this reform to help with. The few markets I've built are important. They're near the ports. Um, but I'm kind of feeling a need to hold back and have this improved credit rating. You know what? We're working on Tariff Act. We're going to be working on Impressment. I'm going to go ahead and take the market reform. That has been the plan. I'm going to stick to it for now. Okay. We've been waiting on ag subsidies for another level of farm mech. We've got that. Let's take that. Okay. And so now we are up to, we're getting 10% from recruit offices and 20%. So we got a 30% buff to our uh, manpower pool, volunteer manpower pool, from these. Plus we just took the Militia Act 2, so that helps. And... Wow, we got a huge volunteer... I. We, it was just a few minutes ago, not that long ago, when we looked at this and we were at like 40-something thousand volunteers available. Now we got over 100,000. I think it's pretty robust. So at this point, I think, uh, I think I'm probably going to shift ag subsidies toward other uses. Industry subsidies, same story there. I'm looking to upgrade that mine. We'll take a look at that in a second, see if we're any closer to that. And, he, and okay, it is time. Uh, and I'm going to take the rifled artillery. We need rifled artillery in the armies. And I think the next thing we'll be going for is to get some medium-range carbines for the calf. Right. Okay. 
How we doing on this uh, iron mine? Please let me upgrade this. I lost where it is. Not quite there. <laughs> We're still a hundred thousand short in subsidies. And I could build it now, but it's going to suck up that entire 3.7 plus an additional 1.4 from the treasury. So, yeah, let's let that run another couple days. This telegraph station's almost done. They're building a hospital now, too, at Lebanon. That sure does look like Billy Yank intends to stay. <laughs> and we've lost sight of this army over here. You know, Kentucky is a Confederate state. Ooh, that's gone blue here. Is he going to Nashville? What is that? Officer Re... Who was defamed? We did not get a... We did not get a defamation message on that. I, I looked at uh, the. I didn't think to look at Price himself. Apparently, Price was defamed after that battle. But he's rehabilitated. Okay. I, I missed that. See? I miss stuff all the time. He's already got replacements coming in. He's regained uh, five or six hundred men since the end of the battle. Still has almost 3,000 disabled. Most of these are going to be combat. Well, 2,000 of those are wounded. And he's got almost 1,000 sick. And he's had a few deserters. That's, too, that's reasonable. Okay, it is January 1st, which means we've got this month's Econ and Intel reports. So we're down to BBB. We were at BBB Plus at the start of this episode. Uh, so that's mediocre. Debt has increased. We're up to $340 million in national debt. Recovery, medio uh, wealth is still mediocre and decreasing. And tax revenues are going down some more. Reflects the fort. This trade gap is very slowly continuing to get better. And we started off as something like a three to one disparity, and we're down almost to two to one. Almost. Like 2.2 .2 or 2.3 to 1 imports to exports. So this is actually improving. It's basically static. And we're lacking iron ore, we know. <laughs> Food and iron. Same three as last time. What about our intel report? Okay, they're going for confiscation. That makes sense. They have the same money problems we do. Uh, okay, they did. They took a level of trade warfare. That sucks. And they took market reform. A 
Apparently they haven't recently recruited any men. But they've made some more fleets. Um, and have started 21 more ships. Atlantic Squadron near New Jersey. Okay. Long Island Sound. Okay. Lake Michigan. Florida Keys. All right. Yeah, the morale's increased a little bit. I can see that. And, okay. Apparently, they're still carrying out offensive operations, which we see here in Central Kentucky. All right. I think that's a good spot to end this particular episode here on New Year's Day 1862. Oh, my gosh. I messed up. I took that damn project and then didn't order any guns. <laughs> All right. Three, uh, yeah, three-inch ordnance. We want a lot of these. I am going to order as many as I can. That's five months. That puts us into mid-May these would be showing up what if I 256 okay that's gonna be early April let's go with early April 256 three inch ordinance Okay, so let's see what's up with this wired. 1800 yard, good. Very good accuracy, good. 2.5 rounds a minute. So this is actually pretty darn similar to the parrots and the 10 pound parrots and the three inch. So let's do 256 of these. Right. Yeah, and I think that will do for this episode. If you like what we're doing with the channel, you like the content, then leave a like, leave a comment, maybe even subscribe. If you're new to the series, new to the channel, you, you want to see what's transpired in this campaign up till now and you haven't seen that, then I'm linking a playlist right here to this series. At any rate, Thank you very, very much for watching. I appreciate it.